The listening part of occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beat sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract once only. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Brian Harris. For questions one to twelve, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, last year I had a traumatic injury to my left posterior. I got hit from a boat while I was in the water. I immediately rushed to the hospital where I had to undergo surgery. I'm still having an external fixation on the wound for healing fractures in the leg. I had undergone grafting and full thickness skin grafting close to defects in my posterior thigh. It is almost healed right in the gluteal fold on the left area. In several areas along the graft site and low in the leg, there is several hypergranulation tissue developed. Is there any bleeding from the wound? No, doctor. Okay. What's your age? Forty-two, doctor. Do you drink or smoke? No, doctor. Had any other illnesses in the past? Nothing other than Clostridium difficile in the recent past. Are you taking any medication? I am taking Cipro and Flagyl. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Any illness history of family members? My maternal grandmother had pancreatic cancer. My father had prostate cancer, and he has heart disease and diabetes. Well, your physical examination results are perfectly okay. Cardiology reports are regular. There is no S3, S4, or gallop. There is no murmur. Abdomen is soft. It is non-tender. There is no mass or organomegaly. Your right lower extremity is unremarkable. Peripheral pulse is good. Your left lower extremity is significant for the split thickness skin graft closure of a large defect in the posterior thigh, which is nearly healed. Hypergranulation tissue both on your gluteal folds on the left side. There is one small area right essentially within the graft site, and there is one small area down lower on the calf area. There is an external fixation, and that comes out laterally on your left thigh. The pin sites look clean. There are several multiple areas of hypergranulation tissue on the left posterior leg associated with a sense of trauma to your right posterior leg. I would recommend series of treatment with chemical cauterization of these areas till these are closed. Extract two, questions thirteen to twenty-four. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Thomas Andrews. For questions thirteen to twenty-four, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes.
Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Have seated. May I know your problem? Well, I'm a patient with hypertension, chronic intermittent bipedal edema, and recurrent leg venous ulcers. I had a vascular surgery for non-healing right ankle stasis ulcer. I have a serious concern today that I had a low-grade fever of 100.2 early this morning. Otherwise, everything was well. The thing is, I was not even aware of the fever. I do have some ankle pain, worse on the right than the left. Okay, what's your age? Fifty-two, doctor. Do you drink or smoke? No, doctor. Are you getting nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea? No, doctor. May I know your previous illness history? Well, hypertension, exploratory laparotomy in 2016 for abdominal obstruction, cholecystectomy in 2017, chronic intermittent bipedal edema, venous insufficiency, chronic recurrent stasis ulcers. What medications are you taking? Primaxin, daptomycin, clonidine, furosemide, potassium chloride, lisinopril, metoprolol, renitidine, colase, amlodipine, zinc sulfate, lortab, multivitamins with minerals. Are you allergic to any medicine? No, doctor. Well, the physical examination shows heart rate seventy-three, respiratory rate twenty. Blood pressure one hundred and four over sixty-seven, temperature ninety-eight point three, and oxygen saturation ninety-two percent on room air. There is hyperpigmentation involving distal calf on both legs. There is an open wound on the right medial malleolar area, measuring nine by five centimeters, with minimal serous drainage. Peri wound is hyperpigmentated. With a hint of erythema extending proximally to the medial aspect, distal third of the right lower leg, there is warmth but minimal tenderness on palpation of this area. There is also a wound on the right lateral malleolar area, measuring four by three centimeters. Another open wound on the left medial malleolar area, measuring seven by four centimeters. Wound edges are poorly defined. Laboratory results show white blood cell count is five point eight with sixty four percent neutrophils, H and H eleven point three over thirty three point eight, and platelet count one hundred and seventy six thousand, BUN and creatine nine point two over zero point five two, albumin three point six, AST twenty five, ALT nine, ALKFOS eighty seven. And total bilirubin zero point six. Chest X-ray shows chronic bibascular subsegmental atelic stasis, likely related to elevated hemidiaphragm, secondary to chronic ileus. No absolute findings. You have multiple previous wound cultures, positive for pseudomonas, enterococcus, and stenotrophomonas. Fevers, right leg, ankle, cellulitis. Chronic recurrent bilateral ankle venous ulcers, hypertension. I am ordering two sets of blood cultures, injection with daptomycin and primaxin four. I am ordering an MRI of the right ankle to check for underlying osteomyelitis. Follow up results of wound cultures. Additional treatment and medications are upon follow up. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions twenty-five to thirty, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at the question twenty-five. You hear a discussion about common types of neuropathic pain. Now read the question.
Hello, Doctor. What are the common types of neuropathic pain? Well, while there are countless types of neuropathic pain, some of the prominent types include carpal tunnel syndrome. It's caused by nerve compression in the wrists and causes pain in the wrist, thumb, and fingers. Central pain syndrome can occur after nervous system damage, such as a stroke. Degenerative disc disease. One may feel neuropathic back pain if it causes damage to the nerves entering or exiting the spine. Diabetic neuropathy causes stabbing pain in the hands and feet of some diabetic patients. Phantom limb pain can occur in some patients after a limb is amputated. Postherpetic neuralgia is brought on by an outbreak of shingles and persists after the condition has cleared. Pudendal neuralgia is a type of pelvic pain caused by compression of the pudendal nerve. Sciatica is caused by compression or irritation of the sciatic nerve and often results in shooting pain that radiates down the back of the leg. Trigeminal neuralgia is characterized by shooting neck and facial pain. Question twenty six: You hear a discussion bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of bronchodilators used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are often prescribed a bronchodilator, a type of medication for relaxing the air passages to help breathe better. Typically, the medications are inhaled through the mouth using a metered dose inhaler, but also come in liquid, pill, injectable, or suppository formulations. The three classes of bronchodilators commonly used to treat chronic obstructive pulmonary disease are beta adrenergic, beta agonists, anticholinergics, methylxanthines. Beta adrenergic agonists are a type of medication that binds to specific receptors in the lung called beta adrenoceptors. By doing so, they block the trigger to bronchial spasms and allow airway passages to open. Beta agonists can either be short-acting or long-acting. Which are delivered either orally or through a metered dose inhaler. Generally, the inhaled method is preferred as it alleviates symptoms faster. Anticholinergic blocks the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the central and the peripheral nervous system to its receptor in nerve cells and inhibit parasympathetic nerve impulses. Methylxanthines affect not only the airways but stimulate heart rate, force of contraction, and cardiac arrhythmias at high concentrations. Question twenty seven: You hear a discussion about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Now read the question. Doctor, what are the various types of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? There are different kinds of functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Gastrinoma usually forms in the head of the pancreas and sometimes forms in the small intestine. Most gastrinomas are malignant. Insulinoma forms in the head, body, or tail of the pancreas. Insulinomas are usually benign. Glucogenoma forms in the tail of the pancreas. Most glucogenomas are malignant. VIPomas, which make vasoactive intestinal peptide. Somatostatinomas, which makes somatostatin. Question twenty eight: You hear a discussion about melasma and different types of melasma. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What is melasma, and what are the types of melasma? Well, melasma is a common patchy brown, tan, or blue-gray facial skin discoloration, normally seen in women during their reproductive period. 
It typically appears on the upper lips, upper cheeks, forehead, and chin of women of 20 to 50 years of age. There are four types of pigmentation patterns are diagnosed in melasma. Epidermal, dermal, mixed, and an unnamed type found in dark-complexioned individuals. The epidermal type is characterized by the presence of excess melanin in the superficial layers of skin. Dermal melasma is defined by the presence of melanophages throughout the dermis. The mixed type includes both the dermal and epidermal type. In the fourth type, excess melanocytes are present in the skin of dark-skinned individuals. Question 29. You hear a discussion about possible causes of arthritis. Now, read the question. Hello, Doctor. Can you tell me what are the possible causes of arthritis? Osteoarthritis is associated with cartilage damage. Genetic conditions are thought to play a role in osteoarthritis. Age alone is no longer seen as the cause of osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease that develops as the immune system malfunctions and attacks the body's own tissues. Gout develops when excessive uric acid accumulates in the body and crystals are deposited in the joints. Reactive arthritis causes joints to become inflamed as a result of an infection that triggers the immune system. Usually, this condition resolves. Question 30. You hear a monologue of a physician on granulomas. Now, read the question. Granulomas are tissue nodules of immune cells that occur in diseases such as sarcoidosis and tuberculosis that can damage many organs. It is the chronic activation of the metabolic sensor mammalian target of rapamycin that is responsible for the granuloma's formation. In sarcoidosis, this mechanism leads to a course that is chronic and difficult to treat. Since mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors belong to a group of drugs already licensed for clinical use, these findings offer new and quickly testable treatment options. This is the end of Part B. Now, look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at extract 1. Extract 1, questions 31 to 36. You hear the lecture given by a physician on colectomy surgery. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello, Doctor. Please explain to me different types of colectomy surgery. Well, the surgery to part of or all the colon or the large intestine is called a colectomy, and there are many types of colectomy surgeries. The type of surgery and how much the colon is removed based on the disease and the extent of damage to the large intestine. In the proctocolectomy, the colon is removed along with the rectum. The term procto refers to rectum. With both the colon and the rectum removed, the body will need a new way to dispose of stool. For most people with inflammatory bowel disease, either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, a proctocolectomy also means the creation of an ileostomy. When part of the small intestine is brought through the abdomen to create a stoma, it is called an ileostomy. Therefore, the stool can be passed through the stoma and is received in an ostomy device worn on the outside of the body. The ileostomy can be temporary or permanent. J-pouch surgery is an ileopouchanal anastomosis, which is done along with proctocolectomy or after proctocolectomy. In this surgery, the last part of the small intestine, called the terminal ileum, is sewn together in the shape of a J and can then hold stool for a period of time, serving like a rectum. Ileoanal anastomosis is done to restore the ability to move stool through the anus. In this surgery, after the rectum and colon are removed, the small intestine is connected directly to the anus. In the total colectomy surgery, entire colon will be removed. Unlike proctocolectomy, the rectum is not removed in this surgery. A total colectomy with partial or complete rectum left in place may be done in certain cases of either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. In a partial colectomy, part of the colon is removed, and it may also sometimes be called a subtotal colectomy. A partial colectomy may be done for certain patients with Crohn's disease, while it is also done to treat colon cancer or diverticulitis. This surgery is never done for the patients with ulcerative colitis, since the disease will often recur in the healthy section of the colon that is left. In hemicolectomy surgery, either the left or the right part of the colon is removed. In a right hemicolectomy, the cecum, ascending colon, and a portion of the transverse colon are removed, along with the appendix is attached to the ascending colon. Whereas in a left hemicolectomy, the descending colon and part of the transverse colon are removed. In this surgery, typically the healthy sections of the colon are connected together. Therefore, an ostomy is not required. Now, look at extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on ankle fractures. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Hello, Doctor. What are the types of ankle fractures? There are different types of ankle fractures, and treatments vary significantly based on the location and severity of the injury. When a broken ankle occurs, the injury may be to the end of the medial malleolus, called tibia, or to the lateral malleolus, called or both. There are many types of ankle fractures, and let me explain you about certain common types ankle fractures. 
Lateral malleolus fractures is the ankle fracture that involves only fibula. Most of the lateral malleolus fractures can be treated without surgery if the ankle joint remains stable. A surgery is recommended in case of an unstable joint or the ligaments are damaged. However, the hint for surgical recommendation is when the fibula fracture is within 4 cm of the end of the bone. In such case, the fracture can be treated non-surgically if there is no injury on the inner part of the ankle. Medial malleolus fractures involves only tibia. This fracture occurs to the bone on the end of the tibia, which is called the medial malleolus. An isolated medial malleolus fracture is very rare compared with an isolated lateral malleolus fracture. Generally, a displaced medial malleolus fracture is treated with surgery. Bimalleolar ankle fractures involves both fibula and tibia that occur when there is an injury to both the inner and the outer side of the ankle, always resulting in an unstable ankle joint, and surgery is to be recommended for most of the patients with this kind of fracture. Even if the fracture heals without a perfect positioning, the ankle joint alignment will remain disturbed and could result in accelerated arthritis of the ankle. Even after a surgery, ankle cartilage can be damaged at the time of the fracture, resulting in arthritis. Therefore, a proper diagnosis and repair of these fractures is essential to avoid the chance of long-term problems. Although a bimalleolar equivalent fracture involves only fibula, there is also a tear of the ligaments on the inner side of the ankle, resulting in instability of the ankle joint. Therefore, a surgery is essential. Trimalleolar fracture involves both fibula and tibia like a bimalleolar ankle fracture. However, the bone in the back of the tibia called the posterior malleolus is also fractured. At times, if a large fragment of bone is fractured, a surgery is inevitable. Posterior malleolus fracture involves only tibia. This is a rare injury in isolation. Fractures of the posterior malleolus generally occur in association with bimalleolar ankle fractures. In such case, the injury is called a trimalleolar ankle fracture. Maison nerve fracture involves both fibula and tibia, which is a less common injury. However, this injury needs to be diagnosed thoroughly, as there are chances of missing this injury. In this type of fracture, the bone is injured on the inner side of the ankle, called the medial malleolus. The force of this injury passes through the large ligament that connects the two bones of the leg, called the syndesmosis. Since the damage is caused to this supporting ligament, the ankle becomes unstable and most often a surgery is recommended. This is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.
That is the end of this listening test.